Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we find out what happens when a baby falcon meets a balloon telescope. <laughs> a baby falcon <laughs> and a balloon telescope. Is this one of those unlikely animal friend stories, like when a goat and a duck become friends? <laughs> It's a story of how science can lead to some unexpected situations and create some unforgettable lessons. Erica Hamden is an astrophysicist, which means she studies the physics and chemistry of space. So when I called her up for an interview, I had a very specific question to ask. Did you ever think that working in astrophysics would eventually lead you to rescue a baby falcon from a telescope? No. <laughs> Rescuing a baby falcon turned out to be a super great day in my career, so I think it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like there's a story here. <laughs> How does one end up rescuing a baby falcon from a telescope? The story takes place in a small town that's also the setting of a Wild West legend. It's only known for Billy the Kid, who was like an outlaw back in the day, was shot in Fort Sumner, so his grave's in Fort Sumner. I know Billy the Kid. So it's like an old Wild West town. Gunslingers, bank robberies, all that stuff. It's calmed down a lot in the past hundred years or so. Not so much happening there now. It's the kind of place that you would like drive through on the way to somewhere else, like maybe Roswell. It's actually pretty close to Roswell. Okay, so you got Billy the Kid's grave in the place known for alien conspiracy theories. So what was Erica doing there? She was there for the space balloons. <laughs> Are the aliens involved in the space balloons too? Did they give us the balloons? Is that why they're you called can space see, balloons? Yeah, you can see how they might be related, but they're not. <laughs> so there's a whole division of NASA that's called the Columbia Scientific Ballooning Facility, and they are basically like a team of engineers who just do balloon launches. So you're telling me that NASA, the famous space agency, has a group of people who launch balloons? Yes, the balloon people. I call them the balloon people. I don't know what their preferred nomenclature is, but I feel like balloon people is so good. <laughs> so she means the balloon people might not call themselves balloon people. Right, but we're going to go with it now. <laughs> <laughs> So why does NASA hire balloon people, and do they wear clown noses? <laughs> no, they're not entertainers, they're engineers. And it takes some really high-level balloon knowledge to blow up a balloon this big. The fully inflated balloon is, like, as big as a football stadium. I think it's as tall as, like, the Washington Monument. That is a shockingly large balloon. Space balloons are filled with helium and launch into the stratosphere, the area between Earth's atmosphere and what we think of as outer space. And they're up there for just a short time. It actually only stays up for one day. So what's the purpose of that beyond just having a balloon that's bigger than a stadium? <laughs> it's an experiment and it saves money. <laughs> For our telescope, Fireball, we wanted to test a bunch of technology, and it's much less expensive to do that on a balloon, where you build your telescope and you send it into the stratosphere, and it's a space-like environment, but it's, I don't know, I want to say like a hundred times cheaper than actually putting it in space. Erica's dream is to study distant galaxies with a new tool that she built to measure hydrogen, which is an important element in the formation of stars. She's in charge of the entire Fireball telescope project. The scientific goal of Fireball is to understand why galaxies look the way they do. Wait, wait. Fireball telescope project? Yes, there's a lot of different words behind it. But... Like all the scientists in the cafeteria are like, can I have the cool named project? <laughs> the name is a huge part of the appeal for sure. So why does it need to be launched in an old west town in the middle of nowhere? Mostly so that your telescope doesn't fall on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Good reason. <laughs> After its short flight, the scientific instrument has just a parachute to guide its trip back down. So the fewer people below it, the better. <laughs> that seems to me like a sufficient reason. Yeah. 
So the day of the baby falcon comes when Fireball is almost ready for launch. I feel like this story just keeps getting cooler. So it starts like any other day in Fort Sumner where <laughs> we would, we'd all show up to the airport. The airport is a landing strip and a bunch of boxy buildings around it. One of them is an airplane hangar where Fireball was being assembled. And I was like partially running errands. So I think I had to go to the post office. And then I was coming back and the the French guys all run out. Wait, so where'd the French guys come from? <laughs> Erica was working with a team of French scientists in addition to the balloon people. <laughs> <laughs> this story has like an expanding cast of characters. <laughs> First, you've got the balloon people, then you've got the fireball, then you've got the falcon. Well, wait, we haven't even got the falcon yet. We just got the French people. We're to the French people part. (laughs) All right. They were like, oh, we need your help. And they like showed me this little baby falcon that was in a baseball cap. So where'd the falcon come from? It turns out the team had been hearing bird sounds from near the doors of the hangar for the past week or so. They'd figured that there was a nest around, but they didn't think too much about it. While Erica was gone at the post office, the French team had opened the doors. And so they had opened the doors and the nest was right above the doors and the bird was trying to learn how to fly. And so it just like jumps out of the nest and swooped in. The falcon landed right on the telescope. And like basically freaked out because it was like a little baby falcon that didn't know what was what. Started like clawing at things. Oh no, that could be really bad for the telescope and probably for the falcon too. Yeah, so the French guys acted quickly. Well done. One of the French guys grabbed it and we didn't have, they didn't have anything to put it in so they just like put it in a baseball cap. And then they brought it out to me and they were like, what do we do? <laughs> so Erica's not trained in wildlife management or baby falcon rescuing, but she's the head of the team. It's her job to know what to do in general. So I was like, uh, I don't know. But that was always what what I feel like sort of when you're in charge of something, like if they don't know how to solve the problem, then like you better just figure out how to solve the problem. Like that's what your job is. So I was like, okay, we're going to call animal control. It turns out Fort Sumner wasn't big enough to have an animal control. So she calls the next town over. So I called them and I said, I'm in Fort Sumner. I have this like injured baby falcon. Like, what should I do? And they were like, oh, we don't cover that area. You have to call the sheriff in Fort Sumner. And I was like, okay. So I called the sheriff. Wait, so she called the sheriff in a Wild West town. And was he like... Well, it's a lot easier than finding outlaws. (laughs) The sheriff basically sent her on a game of telephone, all while she's guarding this baby falcon in a hat. The falcon was clearly very stressed out, and it was like curling its claws up, kind of like clenched fists. They decided to make it as comfortable as they could. So we put it in a cardboard box, and we didn't really have anything soft, so we used a bunch of lab, like tissue paper, basically. There's like lab wipes that you use to clean stuff. So we like put tissues in the box. We like put the bird in the box and then we filled a little Petri dish with water in case it was thirsty. I mean, uh, that's what anyone would do with a rescue animal, but they only have lab materials to try and help it. It's like the most sciencey rescue. (laughs) (laughs) Finally, help came in the form of a phone call from the New Mexico Department of Fish and Game. And the guy was like, okay, here's what you need to do. Like, I'm going to the northwest part of the state to like pick up a different animal so I can't get to you until tomorrow at the earliest. No, so what's she gonna do? The fish and game guy told Erica to take the falcon in its box and put it far away from people. If it hasn't flown away by the end of today, bring it inside and keep it safe. And then I'll come tomorrow and like text me how it's doing. So I like had this guy, I think I still have his phone number in my phone because I like never deleted it. But I sent him updates like every hour about how the falcon was doing. I love how the astrophysicist's job has suddenly become baby falcon babysitter. Exactly. So Erica moved the bird box far away from the hangar out into the scrub. At first, the falcon just laid on its side, not moving. But after a few hours, it got up. So it had calmed down enough that it was just standing in the box and it's looking out over the top of the box with its like little hawk eyes, like ready to eat anybody that comes by. It was so angry and 
amazing. Erica was just in awe of this little baby bird. I loved how wild it was. I don't have a lot of encounters with wild animals in my life. And it was just like really wondrous to like see something so magnificent up close. The baby falcon seemed to be coming back to life after its fall from the nest. And then a couple hours later, I went out again and it it was jumping around near the box and then it eventually flew away. So this is like a real life version of Are You My Mother? <laughs> It is. Erica texted the fish and game guy that he wouldn't need to come pick the falcon up. Then she went home to sleep. The next day when she arrived at the airport for work, she immediately looked for the baby falcon. Uh, We saw it like swooping around the parking area. Um, Still not like perfect at flying, but much better than it was the day before. With the baby falcon safe and sound, Erica returned her focus to the telescope. But she kept her connection to the wild bird, which seemed to be looking after her. The whole rest of the time that we were there, I would look up for it. And it's like parents. And there were always these like falcons circling, hopefully eating mice and having a great time. So the baby falcon learned to fly, but did the telescope? What happened with the launch? Well, that story has a different kind of ending. The day finally came when Fireball was ready, and the balloon people began to inflate the massive balloon. So I've never been skydiving, but it just, it, it, it had this feeling as if I had just taken like a giant leap off of something. So it's definitely like scary anticipation. Erica had been working on Fireball for 10 years, designing the instrument and preparing for the launch. The moment when the telescope took flight was surreal. I'm looking at it like go up into the sky and I think like, I like did not think that I was ever going to get here, that we would ever get to the point where it would really be happening. And then it's happening. And that was like so thrilling. So wait, is so there like a big fiery rocket launch? No, it's really more like releasing a balloon. The balloon just drifts up towards the sky, carrying what's called the payload, a bundle of scientific instruments attached. So then we checked that the communications are working, everything is nominal. So that means everything was working, right? Right. The team monitored fireballs climb through the layers of the Earth's atmosphere. They could see that the instrument was sending back data, But 12 hours after the launch, they saw the balloon wasn't behaving the way that it should. We realized that the balloon was very low in altitude. It was much lower than it should have been. And the balloon people came down and told us that there was a hole in it. Oh no, I'm no balloon person, but I am aware that balloons don't work so well when there's a big hole in them. The balloon never got high enough to take the measurements they needed to see if their instrument actually worked in space. What a bummer. Because it wasn't actually high, we got less data. The data is worse. The flight had failed, and Erica felt really bad about it. But she also knew these things happen in science. Science works because people don't give up. The real process of science is, like, kind of messy and challenging and like you try things and they don't work and you do everything right and sometimes it still doesn't work but the important thing is that like you keep going. Erica picked up the instrument that fell back to earth. She dusted it off. She took it back to the lab and she made some improvements and she's gonna try again with Fireball 2. I always love a good sequel so will the baby falcon be starring in this one too all grown up and this time thirsty for revenge. (laughs) Balloon Telescope versus Baby Falcon Part (laughs) 2. More feathers, more helium. (laughs) What have you tried to do or make that didn't work the first time? Did you go back and try again? Whether it's a science experiment or a sport or even an art project, you've probably had an experience like Erica's. I mean, whose goals haven't been interrupted by the discovery of a baby bird? (laughs) Or a hole in your balloon. (laughs) Haven't you popped like a lot of balloons that you just end up going on to the next balloon? Until you run out of balloons, yes. Yes. (laughs) Think 
about all the ways in your life that you've kept going. How did you use the lessons you learned to try again? Thanks to Erica Hamden, professor of astrophysics at the University of Arizona. Erica is an If Then ambassador. If Then seeks to further advance women in science, technology, engineering, and math by empowering current innovators and inspiring the next generation of pioneers. This episode is made possible by an If Then mini grant. If you want to hear more about Fireball, listen to our special bonus interview episode available for patrons who pledge $1 or more a month on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. We'll also have free resources on our website, including Erica's TED Talk and a NASA documentary about space balloons. Claire Glendening is our intern. Sarah Robertson Lentz made the episode art and is our head of partnerships. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote and produced this show. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music that you hear. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery.